you've been here before, I'm going to do the same spiel I do every time. Um, so you have a little note card. If you didn't get one, does everyone have a note card? Yeah, hold your note card up. Yes. Uh, nice. All right, so if you don't have a note card, since there's so many of you, which is super awesome, we ran out of note cards, which is great. I'm really excited about that. However, we don't have any. Um, so Lily has been really cool and ripped up some papers if you didn't get a note card, or if you have a piece of paper, because you're a high school student, you should have that. Um, you can just write it on a small piece of paper. Resourceful. Um, so anytime during this lecture, if you learn something about yourself, Ms. Giordano, the world, however, if you get a feeling in the middle of this, write it down. Write it on the note card, and then at the end, we share it with her. So don't say anything super mean or you can, but you know, she'll know about it. So be careful. Anyway, so we're also going to be passing around a sign-in sheet. So please sign in, because today we are trying to break the record for Real Talk, and we're going to see if we did it. <laughs> And if we can get triple digits, she will currently hold the record at 100 people or more, which is pretty freaking cool. So, without further ado, Mrs. Giordano speaking on anxiety and other high school stuff. Woo! Okay, so first of all, can everybody hear me? Yeah. I don't need a mic or anything, right? Okay. So, first of all, you're going to have to just bear with me a little bit because all of the other teachers that have done these teacher talks have been way cooler than me and have been able to just get up here, and just talk off the cuff, and let's consider the um, topic that I'm speaking on. I have some notes. Okay. <laughs> I need, I just, it's like my little security blanket. Okay, so just, you know. Anyway, help me a little slack. So, yes, I am talking about anxiety today, and I want to start off with a definition. I literally went to the dictionary and looked it up. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines anxiety as a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Okay. And anxiety is something that has been a part of my life since I can remember. And I want to put a little disclosure statement out there that some of these experiences that I'm going to describe to you, some of these thoughts and emotions are going to seem a little crazy to you. And that's okay because to this day, when I look back on them, some of them seem very crazy to me as well. But I assure you that when they were happening, they were very real and um, terrifying at times. My earliest memories of anxiety comes from, I was, I don't know, maybe six or seven years old. I can remember part of my sort of going to bed routine. You know, your parents have tucked you in, you've got your little stuffed animals, the lights are off, and the thoughts would start to come. My, part of my sort of falling asleep procedure was creating lists in my head of things that I needed to worry about. And it was always this voice of the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, what if no one will play with me on the playground tomorrow? What if I don't know how to spell a word on my spelling test? What if I forget the lines in the play this weekend? Just this constant, constant what ifs. And in parent-teacher conferences all the way, even up through, even into high school, I can remember my teachers always describing me to my parents as a worrier. Um, and, you know, someone who is a very cautious person. And I am. Uh, I have never broken a bone. I have never been in any serious trouble. I've never even been on a loop-de-loop -loop roller coaster, okay? Um, I'm, I'm not a risk taker, and I attribute that to the fact that these things cause me anxiety. Um, pretty much in all situations in my life, anytime I come into particularly any kind of new situation, I have to have a backup plan. I have to have an escape route, if 
if you, if you want to call it that. Um, which is exactly why I have my notes here. Should I completely forget everything? I have an escape route. Um, in my adult life, um, there are really three main instances that anxiety really came to the forefront for me. Um, the first being right here at Oakton. My first few years teaching here at Oakton, I was just absolutely fixated on the, the thought that I had to be in my classroom anytime before my students arrived. So, for example, Think about the class that you have right after lunch, okay? When you go to that class and you are approaching that classroom, is the door open? Is it closed? Is your teacher there waiting for you? Or is your teacher not there waiting for you? I can remember those first few years absolutely wolfing down my lunch in like 10 minutes or less because I just, I, I absolutely had to get back to my classroom before my students got there. In my mind, the thought was, if my students had to wait outside my door, even for a minute, um, they would lose respect for me. And if they lost respect for me, then they're not gonna listen to me. And if they're not gonna listen to me, then how am I supposed to teach them? And if I can't teach them, then I've lost control of my classroom. And if I've lost control of my classroom, things are gonna get unruly and out of control. And if things get unruly and out of control, I mean, it's only a matter of time. There's gonna be a fight that's gonna break out. <laughs> right? Can you see this spiral of totally irrational thought, this irrational worry, but that is honestly what I thought would happen. Just if I, if I wasn't there to greet my students when they came back from lunch. Um, another time that stands out in my mind was um, a time when I was invited to one of my girlfriends for a bachelorette party. And the plan was, it was a group of about 10 of us. Um, we were going to meet at this restaurant down in DC, have dinner, drinks, maybe go out dancing later, just you know, have a great time. And I knew the, the bride-to-be pretty well, but the other girls in the group, I had only met a few of them just a handful of times, didn't really know them well. And I became absolutely convinced that I was going to have an awful time. It was going to be hard. Um, social anxiety was a big problem for me at that time. And I just was convinced it was going to be awful. And I didn't really want to go. And my husband, to try and calm me down, said, hey, listen, no big deal. You know, if you find that you're just not having a good time, you're not really feeling it, just, just call a cab. A cab will bring you home. No big deal. Okay, well, again, let me say, to a person who is struggling with anxiety, the most rational solutions, the most soothing, calming person, it's like you can't, you can't hear it. You know, great suggestion from, by my husband, but then I became convinced that, oh, well, there's, there's no way that a cab is going to drive me from D.C. To, all the way to Fairfax, where we were living at that time. And then I would be stuck in D.C. by myself, a young woman alone in a dangerous city. You know, I, I will spare you the details, but you can imagine where my mind was going of, like, all the things, the horrible fates that would befall me in this dangerous city. Um, what ended up happening was, I did end up going, but only because my husband promised to get a hotel room not far from the restaurant. The thought being that if I was just not having a good time and I needed to leave, that I had an escape plan, that a cab would surely take me those 10 blocks to the hotel, but the, the point is, he had to secure a, you know, a two hundred dollar a night hotel room just so that I could go, and it didn't, you know, it didn't wipe out my fears. It just lessened them just a little bit. So I mean, this is this is the level that people have to go to to help people with anxiety. 
The absolute worst experience, though, um, was when I was in graduate school at UNC Chapel Hill down in North Carolina. I had just graduated the previous spring from UVA, and I was in a biochemistry program um, with the goal of getting my PhD. And it started out great. Um, I was taking really challenging, really, really interesting classes, and the graduate students in my cohort were, you know, people like me, and it was just it was cool to be around that. And I was being a teaching assistant for a biochemistry course for undergraduate nursing students. And of course, the most important part of any kind of scientific graduate program is you're doing research in a lab. And I was working in a lab that studied histone proteins. It's cutting edge, it's great. But as fall transitioned to winter, I found that I was spending more and more time helping my nursing students and less and less time in the lab, which is where you're supposed to be as a graduate student. And I started to get into a little bit of hot water with some of my professors about how I wasn't fulfilling my responsibilities there. And I sat back and thought, you know, I think this is, this is a real sign. Um, I'm, I'm not very good at research. It's not what I enjoy. And I made a decision in December, it didn't take long, that this was not where I wanted to be. And I decided that teaching was where I wanted to go. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna leave the program and I'm gonna instead trans transfer over to the education college and get my master's in education. Great. Well, if life has taught me anything, it's that those best laid plans just often don't work out the way you think they're going to. Um, something that's kind of unique, in case you don't know, about graduate school in scientific disciplines. It's very different from any other discipline. Students, graduate students in the sciences do not pay tuition to go to graduate school. In fact, it's the other way around. The university pays you, the graduate student, pays you a stipend. Now, it's not much. I mean, <laughs> you're basically living at the poverty level, but still, you're not paying tuition, they're paying you. And this financial situation was what became a real, a real problem. Um, UNC had essentially been paying me this stipend for four months, and when I spoke to the dean and said, listen, I want to leave the program, he essentially said, well, we want our money back. Um, and we went back and forth and back and forth, and eventually he said, look, you can leave the program, but we're not going to allow you to leave until May. So you need to finish out the year, you need to continue going to class, you need to continue research, you need to continue being a TA, and this is what you're going to do. Okay, well, imagine if you will, for a person of my disposition who's an extremely anxious person, this is like the end of the world. Okay, this is the worst possible scenario. Someone has put you in a situation that you don't like, and you can't get out of it. Um, it was a feeling of being absolutely trapped. You know, we, you learn in psychology about that fight versus flight response. And man, I wanted to fly. I wanted out, okay? But what could I do? I mean, I, I didn't have a choice. Without facing some sort of legal repercussions, I had to stay. So just imagine, if you will, where I am at this point, okay? I know that I'm gonna be leaving the program and the university is giving me a really hard time about it. So I'm feeling like a complete failure because the university is really, really hammering it home about how disappointed they are. Um, so I felt like a complete failure. And again, a lot of what I'm gonna to describe to you is what I perceive to be happening. It's not necessarily what was actually reality, but I perceived that I was getting these 
awful looks from my professors who knew that I was leaving the program. I thought I was getting dirty looks from my fellow students in my cohort. Um, ultimately, though, the absolute worst was I felt that I had let my family know. You know, I had heard so many times my parents brag to their friends, oh, Abby's getting her PhD in biochemistry. You know, they were proud. I was proud. And what would they say now? Oh, well, she's just a teacher. You know? I, I couldn't, clearly I couldn't hack it as a graduate student. I couldn't hack it as a PhD candidate. So I guess, I guess I wasn't as smart as they thought I was. I, I guess I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. And it was, it was, it was a, a crushing, realization or what I thought was, was real. Um, you know, all of these things, these worries, these thoughts are welling up inside me and it, it eventually started to exhibit some physical symptoms. Um, I, I basically stopped eating. I rarely slept. I cried a lot. A lot. <laughs> Okay. Um, and I was living on my own at the time um, in an apartment in Chapel Hill. And so when you live alone, there's nobody to see you day in and day out. This, this behavior was left to go unchecked for too long. And I'll never forget the day that everything sort of came to a head. I was in my apartment, I was sitting on the couch, I was watching TV, and I just sort of noticed that my heart was beating just really, really really fast and of course being you know scientifically minded I'm like ooh I'm gonna measure it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna see how fast how fast is fast and you know I, I measured my pulse and it was beating at about 175 beats per minute. Okay just sitting on the couch watching TV not exercising and I thought okay that's a little high. Um, <laughs> and so I thought, okay, I can I can control this. I can I can control this. I can get myself to calm down. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna go lie down, I'm gonna try to take a nap. Didn't work. Um, I thought, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for a run. You know, that's exercise, that'll get your heart rate up to about that level net anyway. Um, and then maybe when I finish the run, you know, my heart rate will just come down naturally. Um, I try drinking excessive alcohol. I'll be open, you know? It's, you know, stimulants versus depressants? I thought, okay, yeah, it's a depressant. Yeah, let me try that. Didn't work. Didn't even budge. And so, at this point, you know, this, the, the worry spiral starts. And I think, okay, I'm, I'm having a heart attack. And so, I call the hospital, speak to the charge nurse, and... God bless her. Um, she said, you know, it doesn't sound like you're having a heart attack, but we do, we want you to come in for a psych evaluation. And I say God bless her because she was so patient with me on the phone. I mean, I was barely coherent on the phone. I was, I was crying so hard she couldn't understand a lot of what I was saying. So I went to the hospital. Spoke to some psychiatrists, some therapists, and they said, you know, basically what you're having is a, is a massive panic attack, and it sounds like this panic attack has kind of been brewing for, you know, the past month. And they gave me, they prescribed for me some anti-anxiety meds and an aggressive schedule of therapy sessions for the next couple of months, and that really did a world of good. And in the end, with the help of some of these therapists that I was seeing, the university and I were able to reach kind of a compromise. Um, I'm forever grateful to these therapists because they really did step in on my behalf and speak to the dean and say, hey, listen, buddy, this, this is a person in crisis and you're not helping. Um, the compromise was I was allowed to stop attending classes and I was allowed to stop my lab work, which was really the place where I was the most unhappy. However, 
the catch was I had to continue being the teaching assistant for the nursing students without pay. That was the deal through the end of the year. And that may seem crazy to you. That may seem like, who would take that deal? Who would take a part-time job when you're living alone, on your own, as an adult? You know, my parents weren't giving me money anymore. Um, who would take a part-time job where you're not getting anything? Well, listen, I was you know, so unhappy. I was willing to accept pretty much any kind of deal just to get away from this place that was so awful for me. And you know, working with the graduate students, that was the part I liked the best anyway. So it, they weren't really asking me a lot, I thought. So I still struggle with anxiety today. Um, it's, it's part of my daily life. However, I have learned coping mechanisms. Um, one is medication. The second is therapy. And my favorite is meditation or mindfulness, okay? Um, unbeknownst to some of you that may know me, um, I do a 10 to 20 minute meditation routine every gold day during my planning period. You may have seen the sign on my door that says, you know, do not knock, do not enter, meditation in progress. Um, it's just, it's something that I do. I've found that Doing that keeps me more calm during the day. It helps me to more rationally evaluate what's going on around me, more skillfully navigate stressful situations. Uh, high blood pressure is, is a natural side effect of being an anxious person. And when I started doing this meditation routine every other day, there was a marked decrease in, in the numbers. And you know, you can look it up, okay? You can Google it. There is a plethora of scientific evidence out there that cites the positive effects on the human body of meditation. You know, even if you're a person that isn't anxious and doesn't have to deal with this, it's it has so many benefits. You, sh you should look it up. Um, there's a an app. There's really two apps that I like. There's one called Calm, just the word calm. Another is called Simply Being. They're both free, okay? Um, they're great, you should, you should really check it out, it's great. I know some of you, your teachers, um, do a regular routine of mindfulness in your classes, and maybe some of you think, oh, we have to do this. Trust me, it's good for your brains, people. Okay, just just suck it up and do it. Okay. So, you know, I, I agreed to do this talk today not because I want you guys to hear my story and think, oh, that's so sad. Oh. No, I I say I, I tell you what's what's happened to me because I'm hoping that these experiences will resonate with at least just one person in this room. You know, maybe somebody in this room can relate to these thoughts and these worries and these emotions that, that I've gone through. You know, maybe there's somebody in here that knows what true panic really is. Um, and if you are one of those people, I, I want to say something to you, and I want everybody to listen. Are you all, are you all listening? Yes? Okay. Here's what I want to say. You are feeling this way. You are not alone. Okay. I just read a statistic that said that um, in your age bracket, 20 percent. And honestly, in the Northern Virginia area, I would bump that up a bit. Okay. But this statistic said 20 percent of people in your age group suffer from some kind of anxiety on a regular basis. So for every five of you that are sitting there, one of you struggles with this. And again, being the Northern Virginia area that we are, I'm going to guess that's more like two out of five. Okay. Um, I can remember one of the most despairing thoughts that I would have when I was, you know, the low of the low times was that I was all by myself and that nobody would understand 
and there was nobody I could talk to, but I want to tell you that there are people <coughs> who understand, and there's more out there than you think. Um, you know, and, and I understand because I have been in your shoes that to a person who has anxiety, me speaking to you, you may not be able to hear what I'm saying, and I get that. But maybe there's a chance that you are hearing. You know, I, I would encourage you if you ever have these thoughts, please, please talk to somebody about it. Talk to your family. Talk to your friends. Talk to your teachers. Um, my own students know that my door is always open. I'm always willing to listen. And even if I don't know you, you can come and talk to me. I will, I will sit with you and, and listen to what you have to say. Because I've been there. And I am sometimes still there. So thank you very much. anxiety that doesn't really want to admit that they do? I would say the best thing you can do... Can you repeat the question? Yes, her question was, like, how do you speak to somebody that has anxiety that maybe is not ready to admit that they do, or you know, what's the best way to speak to someone with anxiety? And I would say the most important thing is to don't, don't try to fix the problem, because they're not going to hear you anyway. Um, I think the number one phrase you don't ever want to say to someone with anxiety is, hey, just relax. <laughs> hey, calm down. It's, it's cool. Just relax. I don't know how to relax. Okay. Um, I would say the most important thing is just, is just to listen. And if you feel that you are not able to help them, then help them to find someone who can. But just listen. That's the best advice I can give. Yes, ma'am. Um, how did you explain your anxiety to your husband? <laughs> um, I didn't really have to explain it so much. I mean, he, he witnessed it firsthand. Um, but it did, once I understood it enough myself, um, I had to say a lot of what I was just saying to her is, hey, it's, Stop trying to fix the problem. Like, I understand that your heart is in the right place and that you're trying to help me, but he has sort of learned that you, he can't fix the problem and he just, he just needs to listen. Um, and he's become very good at that. <laughs> yeah. How did you know you wanted to be a teacher even with things that I need? Because Somebody, and I, I wish I could remember who it was, um, somebody at some point when I was so unhappy, maybe it was one of my therapists, just said, well, where is a time in your life that you are not anxious, when you are happy? And I said, actually, it's you know working with these nursing students. I love it. I spend hours beyond what I'm supposed to because I just like it. And she said, well, if you like that, have, have you ever considered maybe making that into a career? And it was kind of like, oh. Oh, right, yeah, <laughs> of course. And that's why I tell my students all the time, you know, do what you love. Don't, it doesn't even, money, does, don't think about money. Just what, wherever you are happiest in your life, whatever you're happy to do it, that's where you've got to go. Yeah. Yes, Billy. Really. When you were at UNC, did you meet anyone on the basketball team? No. <laughs> I did go to a basketball game, but no, I didn't meet anyone. Sorry, Yeah, no. no. That, that place is like Death Valley. I don't, I don't, I don't like, I don't know.
that I made it myself, I'm really proud of it. Uh, so please stick it in there, and then we'll share it with your daughter. Uh, also, Thursday, Ms. Snyder is going to be talking here uh, about the importance of family, which is really, really important for everyone. Uh, and I just wanted to make a little announcement to the fact that there are 109 people in this room. Did. Um, please sign the sign-in sheet. It'll keep going around, and then if it, the bell rings and still hasn't gotten you, we're going to keep it over there. Sign the sign-in sheet. It's really important. Okay. Thank you so much. Come on, round of applause for you,